Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the webinar featuring the paper, GNSS Spoofing Detection Through Spatial Processing, published in Navigation and written by Fabian Rothmeyer, Dr. Yushen Chen, Dr. Sherman Lowe, and Dr. Todd Walter. First, we want to remind everyone that registration for ION GNSS 2021 is open and the technical program is online. ION GNSS will take place in a hybrid uh, uh, event uh, from September 20th through the 24th in St. Louis, Missouri, and online. For more information, go to ION.org. Today's webinar will be presented by Fab uh, Fabian Rothmeyer, one of the paper's authors. Uh, Fabian is a PhD candidate in aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford University. He's received degrees from the University of Applied Sciences in Bremen, Germany, and his master's degree from Stanford University. Previously, he's worked for Airbus Defense and Space, the European Space Agency, and he is also a trained airline pilot. We greatly appreciate the time and work that Fabian has put into this webinar. Note that this paper is available to download from our website. You can read the full text of the paper there, and we'll put a link to that in the uh, chat here in the viewer. Following the presentation, he'll take questions. To ask a question, you can click on the Q&A button in the Zoom viewer. So thank you for joining us today, and we'll now turn it over to Fabian. Thank you for the introduction, Rick. Uh, thank you all uh, very much for joining, um, and thanks to the ION for this opportunity to, uh, to present our paper here. Looking at the past speakers uh, that have presented at these webinars, it's really an honor to uh, get this opportunity here today. Let me uh, share my screen here so you can all see the slides. we go. Yeah, so uh, this morning, this evening, this afternoon, this night here, uh, from wherever you are, um, we will talk about spoofing detection through spatial processing. So through direction of arrival um, based measurements. Um, as Rick said, this uh, paper is published in the summer 2021 issue of navigation. And uh, well, it's referenced at the end and in, uh, in the queue in the chat uh, window as well. I do want to acknowledge my co-authors here that have helped a tremendous amount um, in the work leading up to this paper. Um, but you, you'll only be listening to me this morning, but uh, really there's, there's a lot of credit that uh, goes to them. I'd like to start with a quick overview of uh, what we'll talk about here this, uh, today. I'm gonna start with a brief description of the problem setup. This may be, uh, some of this may be familiar to, to many of you. Um, if you've worked with direction of arrival based spoofing detection before, but there will be some nuances already in there that are different um, from, from other approaches maybe. We'll then look at some application examples, flight data and live spoofing data, um, and uh, we'll see how well uh, that problem setup works. We'll then go back and revisit the original hypotheses and assumpt assumptions we've made in the problem setup and uh, sort of do a reality check if, uh, to see if they still work or if they actually um, match what we see outside. <clears throat> we'll conclude uh, with some conclusions. I'll point you to some resources that uh, have been published uh, together with the paper. And I'll mention some recent extensions that usually would be future work, but uh, since obviously this work has been done a little while ago, <clears throat> some of that future work has been, uh, has been done by now. With that, uh, I'll dive right in. Direction of arrival based spoofing detection um, is essentially leveraging the spatial diversity we have in the GNSS signals. Usually we receive signals from all across the sky. We see that reflected in the, in the DOP, for example. Under nominal conditions now, the assumption if you want is that, or the, the null hypothesis we call it, so that the nominal conditions we define that the direction measurement to one satellite, satellite I here, make it a laser pointer satellite I here, um, and the direction measurement to satellite uh, J is, is different. Specifically, the difference between the two is, uh, is the same difference that we would expect based on the information we have in the ephemeris. Under spoofed conditions, on the other hand, usually the assumption is that all the signals or a large amount of the signals at least are broadcasted from one direction. So the direction measurement to satellite I is pretty much the same as the one to satellite J. We call this the alternate hypothesis uh, or simply the spoofed conditions. You'll see this indicated as HH uh, often throughout the presentation. On this slide, I'm uh, 
I'm ignoring noise, but obviously there's noise associated with all these measurements. Uh, this is simply just for a high level overview. I'm starting to mention hypothesis here and this hints exactly at what is uh, going on behind the scenes here. It's a statistical hypothesis test. That's at least one approach of going about this. And what the statistical hypothesis test does is it's essentially attempting to solve an optimization problem. We want to minimize the maximum probability of misdetection. So we want to minimize the maximum risk we're exposed to, while at the same time guaranteeing that the probability of a false alert is below some uh, maximum value. That's sort of the continuity requirement. If you want a system that continuously alerts all the time without anything being wrong, it will just get turned off by the pilot or the operator. This is a very verbose uh, way of phrasing an optimization problem. I'm going to uh, take a risk in terms of public speaking and uh, throw math at you at, uh, on slide five, but this is a fairly important. There's some key figures on here that we'll see multiple times throughout the presentation. So we can rephrase this optimization problem. Um, with, everything really comes down to, these, uh, to this comparison. We have log lambda, which is our decision variable, and that's a function of the measurements. We compare that to a detection threshold, gamma. And if log lambda is larger than gamma, we don't raise an alarm. So this would be here, not raising an alarm, given spoofed conditions, so this is a misdetection. We want to minimize the maximum possible misdetection probability across all the spoofed hypotheses that we might want to consider. The false alerts, on the other hand, mean that the log lambda here is smaller than the detection threshold. That means we raise an alarm, um, given nominal conditions. This log, ominous log lambda here, you'll, you can find that in the standard literature. Um, it's nothing but the log likelihood ratio of the measurements under either hypothesis. Now, I don't want us to get lost in the math here. If you would like to read up more on, on this tool that is being used here, essentially it's called a neyman pearson hypothesis test. Um, and under this neyman pearson paradigm, really the important thing to remember is that we're not making any assumptions in terms of prior probabilities. This approach is completely independent of that. Um, it's only dependent on these conditional probabilities of the measurements. So instead of um, trying to wrap our head around the equations, uh, I think this is much better explained with a picture. Log lambda under nominal conditions follows some distribution that we see here as a blue histogram. And we have some model of that distribution indicated by this black line. And if we now obtain a measurement below a certain threshold, we raise an alarm. Now in blue here, we see nominal measurements that are pretty much all on the right-hand side of this threshold. They're not raising an alarm. And spoof measurements hopefully are somewhere here on the left uh, would, and would be indicated by an alarm. Now, this alarm threshold here is set by the distribution of log lambda under nominal conditions and the maximum false alert probability we're, allow we're allowing for. For a tractable monitor, so we can implement this on a receiver realistically, we need a model of like lambda. We need this black line. It's just not feasible to run a new Monte Carlo simulation online on the receiver every couple of seconds for changing conditions. Um, we need somewhat of a closed form solution for this detection threshold. And to obtain this model of log lambda, um, these conditional probabilities here of the measurements are uh, generally, uh, we approximate them with, uh, with Gaussian distributions where usually the measurement noise is Gaussian. Um, this, might seem like a common assumption here, but you shouldn't just let me get away with that. It really depends on um, the technique, on the hardware that is being used to obtain direction measurements. Um, uh, and depending on that hardware, uh, we have to phrase those Gaussian distributions a little bit wider, more conservative to really bound the distribution of measurements to be obtained. But luckily, if uh, we can approximate both these distributions here with Gaussians, then log lambda itself is once again Gaussian. And that's exactly what you can see here in the plot. This black line is a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution, and uh, it approximates fairly well the, uh, the obtained measurements. Now, how is this usually implemented or um, how is this really used? I'm showing two examples here. So we have four satellites in the sky um, indicated by these red dots on these sky plots. So satellites here would be right above the antenna. Satellites at the, uh, at the edge here on the sky plot would be on the horizon. And uh, this indicates sort of as a compass rose uh, where, on the, where along the horizon the satellite signals are coming from. So you have four satellites here. And under and these red dots are obtained from the ephemeris information. 
um, the measurements, the direction measurements we obtain could be, for example, I ran a simulation here for a couple of thousand measurements, um, could be distributed somewhat like this, these blobs. And you can see that uh, under nominal conditions, they don't necessarily align with the red dots. That's simply because the uh, red dots are with respect to a local uh, northeast down coordinate system, but the measured um, directions are with respect to the antenna coordinate system. And so what the difference we see here is simply the antenna attitude. On the right-hand side here, we sp see spoofed conditions where all the measurements are pretty much coming from one direction with some significant noise. And a, an approach that is uh, often or generally followed in the literature is that you say, well, first, we're going to compute our attitude. We're going to fit the measurements to the ephemeris and sort of uh, create the best possible fit we can uh, obtain here. And uh, in this case on the left, it would be simply a rotation um, that uh, makes these measurements fit the ephemeris fairly well. On the right-hand side here, um, the fit is much less, uh, fit, it fits much less well. You might obtain something like this if you rotate it. And this uh, rotation is like, there's actually a very elegant closed form solution provided in this uh, reference here. So whenever you see numbers in these brackets, it's references um, that I'll have a list of those at the end once again. Um, but then what is done for, for spoofing detection is that you essentially compare, well, the measurement error that I'm making after this fit under nominal conditions, it should be zero. Um, the measurements should match the, the actual directions plus some noise. And that's exactly what we see over here on the left. Under spoof conditions, well, we don't really know where the spoofer is broadcasting from. So all we know is that the error should not be zero. It, here in this case, it's fairly large. Um, and so this is called a simple versus composite um, likelihood ratio test or generalized likelihood ratio test. Uh, simple means that uh, we can specifically phrase this nominal hypothesis. And composite means that we cannot exactly specify the spoofed hypothesis. This works fairly well, um, but we propose a different way of phrasing these hypotheses. Specifically, if you go back to the original setup here, what we suggest is that you formulate the problem independent of the antenna attitude. You get rid of this step having to compute the antenna attitude, which is really a nuisance parameter we're not interested in for spoofing detection under nominal conditions, otherwise it can be a very powerful measurement and that is being used in a lot of attitude uh, computation systems. But for spoofing detection, we don't really need the attitude. So instead, we define great circle arcs. So simply the, essentially the distances between these uh, direction measurements we would expect based on the, the positions or the directions of the ephemeris. And then we compare the uh, great circle arcs we would expect under nominal conditions to the ones uh, we actually measure. So once again, here on the left, under nominal conditions, we'd measure pretty much the same grid circle arcs as we would expect. And that's our null hypothesis, or the nominal hypothesis, that the grid circle arcs we measure are equal to the ones we, uh, we would expect. Under spoof conditions, we can now also exactly specify what we expect to see. And that's the difference here. We can exactly say, well, the grid circle arcs should be zero, plus some noise, of course. And so that's what we can see here on the right. The great circle arcs are all pretty much zero. And that's the difference But this setup. Um, this is why it's a simple versus simple hypothesis test where we can exactly specify both hypotheses. Now, I've had a, a very productive back and forth with the reviewers when submitting this paper of how, what we can exactly claim about this statistical test, um, what we converge on. And I think this is a, this is a very good uh, way of phrasing it. It's the uniformly most powerful test independent of nuisance parameters. It's uh, in the lit literature abbreviated with the UMPI test. Um, so it's uh, the most powerful test you can, uh, you can come up with that is independent of any of the nuisance parameters that we get rid of in this phrasing. This results in two to 10 times fewer misdetections, depending on the geometry and where the spoofed signals are coming from. Um, and we're going to see an example in a second of uh, this variation. The caveat is that this comes with a uh, increased computational uh, burden. Specifically, which great circle arcs to use. Um, there is some ambivalence there, and you'll have to try out a couple of combinations until you find a good combination that results in a strong detection. But you can obviously find details of that on the paper, and a GitHub repository that I'll point you to later um, does that for you if you want. So when I say two to 10 times uh, better, what do I mean by that? Well, here we're going to look at scenarios where we have a nine satellite constellation, and between four and nine out of those nine are spoofed. 
So sometimes only some of them are spoofed, otherwise uh, all of them. The direction of arrival measurements come with a standard deviation of 12 degrees. That's fairly large. Um, even very small antenna arrays I've got pretty good by now that are usually better than that. Um, I've chosen this uh, larger, slightly larger than you would maybe expect, simply to obtain finite uh, misdetection values here. If, if, this, uh, if these measurements are very precise, I would have to run a lot, a lot of simulations to really obtain any misdetections. Um, the false alert probability, the maximum false alert probability is set to 10 to the power of minus seven. And uh, here we can see on the right-hand side, uh, the result of that, that uh, the UMPI test uh, continuously outperforms the GLRT depending on the number of spoofed satellites and the geometry uh, by two to the 10, two to uh, 10 times a uh, factor of two to 10. So we're looking at the average misdetection probability here because there's a lot of different sets of four satellites uh, out of the nine that could be, could be considered. And here we're averaging across all of them. So, but as I said, uh, the processing power is uh, slightly higher. Um, you, there's uh, several tricks you can do to, uh, to bring it down. And this is, it's not uh, unrealistic to do in, in real time but it is uh, slightly higher. We can, so this is uh, for the case of an antenna array that gives us two-dimensional um, direction of arrival measurements. Another way of getting through a directional or spatial measurement is using two antennas that are fairly closely spaced. Um, this is, for example, um, described in this very excellent paper that I highly recommend um, called the Summer Squares Detector that is Unfortunately, published in a in a different, uh, much less prestigious uh, journal, but uh, okay. And uh, in this in this paper, they uh, offer a receiver. The authors offer a receiver operating characteristics plot, where for different false alert probabilities, um, we can see the detection probability. So large values are good uh, for for any false alert probability. And here I have a, a personal uh, sort of initiative. If you want, I, I very much appreciate it, or, or I think it would be a good idea if we could maybe, um, I'll plot a false alert probabilities in these plots. Uh, I've seen them in, in several different papers. If we could plot this on a uh, log scale, on a semi-log scale, because I'm personally more interested in uh, false alert probabilities of 10 to the power of minus four, somewhere here close to zero, um, rather than uh, 0.5, which uh, nobody would, would obviously use. Um, but anyway, we can, we can compare. This approach, so a dual antenna setup by itself, we cannot phrase in this uh, UMPI test setup. Um, I, in the Q and A, maybe I can go into details of why that is. Um, but essentially, if we have attitude information available, then we can. And this uh, may sound a little complex, but that's exactly what a transport aircraft has available. For example, it usually has two GNSS antennas, and it obviously has very good attitude information. And so if uh, attitude information is available, and here I'm um, giving us a root mean squared error of uh, two degree for the attitude, it's obviously a lot worse than what a transport aircraft has available. Um, then we obtain receiver operating characteristics that are significantly uh, better than if you only use the dual antenna setup. And this is then using the UMPI test setup. So that's if we have two antennas to uh, obtain a direction of arrival measurement. There's another way of uh, obtaining spatial measurement uh, that was developed in, in our lab at Stanford by uh, a former student, Emily McMillan. That's called uh, using a dual polarization antenna. It's a somewhat special antenna setup uh, based on a dual feed patch antenna. And I do not want to go into the details of, uh, of how this is developed. This is uh, a um, significantly improved upgraded version since the prototype Emily developed. Um, I don't want to get into the details that it's all, uh, all the electronics you need are on a PCB here that is three inch by three inch that so fits into the A-ring form factor for aviation antennas. Um, the basic idea is that you leverage the left-hand circular polarized signal as well. You do not only uh, use the right-hand circular polarized signal. Once you combine them and you shift the right-hand circular polarized signal in, in phase, so you add uh, different uh, phase delays to that signal, you get additive and especially destructive superpositioning here when the phases are opposite of the two signals. And uh, the point in time or the phase delay you have to add to obtain this destructive superposition actually depends on the signal's azimuth um, that, it, that it comes from. So we can measure this, these drops in signal strength for an approximate azimuth measurement. Um, this is uh, what this looks like. So you have the zero knot here for a satellite. You can see these periodic drops 
That's uh, for every time the, the phase shift of cycles through 360 degrees. Um, once we obtain this drop, when we have a destructive superpositioning of the signals. And this results in an uh, in a azimuth measurement or estimate. So in blue and red here, we have uh, azimuth and elevation from the ephemeris. And in yellow, we have uh, our best guess azimuth uh, from, the, uh, from the antenna. And you can see this fits fairly well. Uh, some, a little bit noisy, but fits fairly well. Uh, as long as the nulls, that's what we call these drops in signal strength, are, are large or, and well, well pronounced. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work really well. We don't really obtain very clean nulls and the measurement error really goes up. Um, that's okay. There's uh, many reasons why this can happen that I'm not going to get into here in this talk. Um, the important part is that based on the shape of these nulls, we can obtain an estimate of how precise our measurement is. So we have a very good uh, measurement covariance matrix and uh, we obtain spatial measurements from a single antenna. So the hardware cost, if you want, of this approach is very low, but the measurement noise is significantly increased and it's only an azimuth measurement. But um, we were fortunate uh, through a cooperation with uh, the US Air Force uh, Test Pilot School down at Edwards Air Force Base um, that we were able to fly this, uh, this antenna on an aircraft uh, on several flights. Um, this Test Pilot School has been super cooperative and great to work with. And uh, we can essentially piggyback on their flights. And uh, if uh, we now, if we now look at the results we obtain uh, during these flights, it's obviously nominal conditions, so there's no spoofing. These are the histograms we obtain. So on the left here is a histogram of the measurement error um, normalized by the measurement model that was calibrated on a rooftop in very clean conditions. And we can see that the uh, the measurement error in the blue histogram here slightly exceeds the measurement model. So the tails are st uh, pronounced stronger than what the measurement model predicts. I'm showing this histogram here on a log scale so we can see the tails a little bit better. And this can be an issue because stronger tails essentially means these measurements look less nominal than, uh, than we expect. And that might jeopardize our uh, constraint on false alerts. It might cause us to raise alarms because it looks less uh, nominal than we would expect. And the reasons for this, again, once again, could be, uh, could be many. Uh, Multipath is the first uh, cause that comes to mind, uh, reflections of the tail or the wings, for example. And so one way we've found that uh, works fairly well to, to mitigate the, this, these increased errors is to simply exclude at every epoch the largest outlier, just throw out the worst measurement. So we, we cannot make any decision now about that satellite uh, that we've thrown out because we're ignoring it. But faults in a single measurement um, well, that's, we're protected against that by rain. So we leverage that if you want and simply ignore the worst uh, measurement at every epoch. And now the measurement model nicely bounds the, uh, the measurement errors. That's under nominal conditions. What about spoofed conditions? Well, um, we, this is very recent data, actually the first time really showing this um, from a government sponsored uh, spoofing test that happened uh, not very long ago this year. And here on the left-hand side, we're seeing some estimated azimuth measurements once obtained, once again obtained by a dual polarization antenna uh, for the Galileo satellites we have in view. You can see here that for a couple of the satellites, the measurements all really align. This looks very suspicious. They're all coming from the same direction, but that there's other satellites uh, that are coming from different directions in the sky up here, up here. And the, the black line here, by the way, is uh, simply the standard deviation of all the measurements for sort of a first visual clue of uh, of how well the measurements align, but it's not being used in any statistical test. So some of the measurements here align, but others are coming from different directions. Similar here on the right-hand side for some GPS, or for the GPS satellites during a different time frame, where a lot of the satellite measurements all align very closely, but one of them is an outlier. And only eventually, maybe it uh, eventually becomes uh, captured of the receiver tracking loops of that PRN become captured by the receiver. Uh, and now they all align. We can confirm these observations by looking at the, the signal to noise ratio, for example, on the left-hand side here for Galileo. In the back, you can see uh, multiple satellites. The, the server not exactly aligning. It looks very suspicious, but there's other satellites that have uh, different signal strengths. And you can once again see these periodic drops, these periodic nulls in, uh, in signal strength created by that special uh, DPA setup. Similarly, for the GPS satellites here on the right, um, we can see the a very close aligning here of the, the drops and signal strength. Uh, only one satellite here is going rogue and is uh, completely going against the rhythm until it finally becomes captured here 
and then aligns. That's exactly the outlier we just saw in the previous slide. So under spoof conditions, uh, here, not all the satellites necessarily are being spoofed. So now with these lessons learned from the flight data and the spoof data, um, we can revisit the two hypotheses we uh, phrased in the beginning. And usually we say, well, if things are nominal and the nominal conditions, the direction of arrival measurements should be distributed normally about the true values. And the adjustment that we propose here is that we accept one outlier. We accept one outlier at every epoch. Here I'm showing a sky plot of uh, a couple of GPS satellites. I'm circling once again this one outlier here. This is actually from a different, completely different data set. Um, we have this uh, PRN22 that is uh, showing a large measurement error. Under spoof conditions, on the other hand, we usually say, well, all the measurements should be coming from one direction, right? And here the adjustment we propose is that, well, you really have to consider subsets of direction of arrival measurements, because for one reason or another, either on purpose or um, by, by chance, only a subset of the satellites could be spoofed. And uh, you can see that here on the sky plot where a couple of satellites are coming from one direction, and the remaining ones are really uh, distributed across the sky. So um, that's, uh, that's all nice and well, but this could be a, could be a problem. Because if we want to consider and run a bank of the, uh, hypothesis tests, if you want, for all the possible subsets, uh, subset combinations of satellites, always excluding one outlier and looking at all the possible combinations of spoofed satellites, that can get very expensive. That's a lot of thousands of combinations we have to uh, possibly consider. And every time we have to invert a matrix and that can get very expensive. So what we developed instead is sort of a local greedy iter iterative approach that uh, attempts to find the most spoofed looking subset of satellites while accepting one outlier at every turn. And so what this algorithm looks like is you start here on the top left and this looks a little cumbersome, but we're gonna go through and then we're gonna look at an example right after. We start with the direction of arrival measurements, Y, uh, the truth, V here and the measurement covariance R. And the first thing we do is we define the great circle arcs. Um, and then we said, well, at every epoch, we have to exclude one outlier. We have to accept one outlier. So we've removed the most spoofed looking satellite. Then we compute the log lambda and the detection threshold. And uh, we see if we can raise an alarm. If not, then this set of satellites does not look spoofed enough for us to justify an alarm. So now we remove the least spoofed looking satellite and then in a greedy attempt to find the most spoofed looking subset and we restart the whole uh, cycle. So we forget the multipath uh, mitigation exclusion step we did before. We once again consider all satellites except the one we just excluded, and we restart. We iterate through this cycle until we either raise an alarm or we run out of satellites. You can also stop it earlier, uh, depending on the threat scenario you want to consider or the uh, computational capabilities you have available. But this way, you'll only have to run um, on the order of tens of statistical hypothesis tests instead of thousands. Now, I promised you an example that will make this a lot more clear. So let's uh, let's take a look at one. On the left here, I'm showing you the sky plot of, once again, the live spoofing data of sort of a mixed scenario. Uh, specifically, the measurement values here, or the elevation values, or the true elevation values. And I'm only using the azimuth estimates or measurements that we obtained from the dual polarization antenna. And you can see several measurements here aligning coming from the same direction, but others are uh, appear and on here, uh, they're coming from different directions. On the right-hand side here, I'm showing log lambda values on the x-axis, specifically the measurement we obtain, this vertical line. And I'm showing the distribution we would expect under nominal conditions if all satellites would be nominal, behave nominally. On the left-hand side here in red, the distribution that we would expect if all satellites were coming from, measurements were coming from the same direction. I'm showing, also showing multiple detection thresholds here as dashed lines for different false alert probabilities. Um, and we're going to work with a maximum false alert probability of 10 to the power of minus eight in this example. So under this uh, false alert probability, we cannot raise an alarm. These measurements do not look spoofed enough. So we have to exclude one. Oh, and before I step through this, uh, this cross here means that satellite 11, or PRN 11, was excluded by the multipath mitigation step, um, hence this, this cross. So this is not, it's not considered in this uh, measurement value over here, it's simply thrown out of the consideration. So this does not look spoofed enough, so we have to exclude one satellite. And the satellite that is being excluded is G17. They can go back. It's the one up here uh, that's now being excluded. 
And so from by excluding 17 now, the two distributions move closer together. There's less diversity in the satellites uh, signals that we're uh, considering. So the two distributions move closer together. But our uh, measurement also moves further left with respect to the detection thresholds. So the situation now looks more spoofed, but still not spoofed enough to raise an alarm uh, with a false alert probability of 10 to the power of minus eight. So we have to go one step further and uh, exclude one more satellite. Now uh, it's satellite G20 or Karen 20, uh, measurement is done here that is being excluded. Once again, the two distributions move a little closer together. We lost some diversity and the, uh, the measurement moved further left. It looks more spoofed, but still not spoofed enough. So we have to go one step further, exclude one more satellite. Now this is G13. Um, it was once again done here. Uh, and now finally, our log lambda is below the detection thresholds. Now we can raise an alarm and well, Pier 9 down here got unlucky. It got thrown into uh, the drawer with, uh, with the spoofed satellites. Um, but most importantly, all the spoofed satellites uh, are identified. The ones we've excluded, um, there's three, G17, G20, and 13, and 11. We've, uh, we've not included those in this decision. So we could now either try and see uh, if those four um, look nominal enough that we might consider even using them for navigation, or we simply throw them out as well and say, well, we don't, we're not really sure what to do with those. I think that would depend on the application and the, the safety guarantees you would like. This is just one uh, snapshot, one epoch uh, where this, uh, this worked. Um, we ran this on a different set of live spoofing data collected in 2017. Um, and I'm going to show you sort of the three different approaches we, we could consider. On the left here, we only consider the uh, all satellites are nominal versus all satellites were spoofed hypotheses. So the two very original hypotheses. And uh, here on the x-axis, I'm showing log lambda minus the detection threshold normalized by the standard deviation, uh, somewhat of a complex arrangement. Essentially, it means any value below zero raises an alarm. And the further it is below zero, the more spoofed it looks. Anything above zero does not raise an alarm. And you can see here, if we only consider these sort of uh, original hypotheses, the nominal and spoofed measurements are very much mixed. They look a lot I mean, alike. It's, it's impossible to tell them apart without having a lot of false alerts or missed detections. So the first thing we could do is that we say, well, let's exclude one measurement per epoch. Um, that should get rid of our false alerts, and it does. Now all the false alerts here on the left are, have disappeared, and we have a comfortable margin between the detection threshold and our measurements. But we also lost some detections um, since we're excluding the most spoofed looking satellite at every epoch. Now, let's go one step further and also uh, consider the spoofing of subsets. So really go through this iterative cycle of excluding more and more satellites. And now the spoofed and nominal measurements um, can be told apart uh, better. They actually start to separate really apart from each other. There is still a lot of uh, misdetections here though. Those are very challenging situations where only a small number of satellites are being spoofed. Going through the data, it was sometimes really challenging as a human to, to um, claim the truth value of saying if this epoch is being spoofed or not. Um, and this uh, generation of the dual polarization antenna that was being used here had a very large measurement uncertainty. Um, so in some epochs, we really did not have a lot of uh, information to work with to make a decision of whether this is being spoofed or not. But the constraint on the false alert probability is, uh, is met absolutely. And we did as well as we could with respect to detections. And so with these final results, I'd uh, like to sort of conclude the, uh, the data part uh, of the, uh, the talk and point you to some resources that, that have been used in, in uh, this paper and that I encourage people to, to work with and to look at, because we do make some claims of being better than what other people have done. And that's always a little risky. And the chances are we made a mistake somewhere or maybe other people can come up with better approaches. So I'd very much like for people to, to look at the, the tools and some of the scripts we've developed um, that you can find on, on GitHub. And, it actually, I have to admit, it took me until last night to realize that there was an issue <laughs> that had been raised. It was just someone asking for the paper. Um, but I guess this is also a way to interact with the authors, which is, which is great. It's all written in MATLAB, so hopefully it makes it uh, very accessible to, to everybody. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to draw some conclusions, sort of summarizing the talk and the paper. 
Um, I presented to you a UMPI test structure. We have a simple versus simple uh, hypothesis test. Um, and that results in a two to 10 times improved detection performance at the price or at the cost of slightly uh, increased computational uh, power. We saw that under in a nominal environment for an aircraft, outliers, measurement outliers do already exist, but they're considered in this architecture um, such that we are compliant with our maximum false alert probability. We also saw looking at live spoofing data that the spoofing of subsets of satellites is really a, a very, a, very likely event that can happen for various reasons. Um, and this is considered in the architecture that we're presenting in this paper uh, for a significantly increased detection performance. And with that, usually I'd point to future work, but there's some extensions that we've already uh, looked at and worked on. Um, ways essentially to make this test more powerful. Because if only a small number of satellites are being spoofed, even direction of arrival based approaches, especially if the measurement noise is significant, uh, even, then even they struggle. And one thing you can do is to consider multiple sequential measurements um, in a row. So essentially consider a batch of multiple measurements at various epochs. I'm showing a probabilistic graphical model of the idea um, to combine them for a more educated decision. You do have to take measurement correlation into account, but that's being done in this, uh, in this paper. Another way uh, you can improve your detection performance significantly is to combine these direction of arrival measurements with other um, classes of measurements. For example, pseudo range residuals are a very good uh, combination if that has been suggested in, an, uh, in a very nice IOM paper here. And uh, we've published on that in uh, once again, a less uh, prestigious uh, competing journal um, that I encourage you to look at. And with that, um, yeah, I have a list of the references here that I'm happy to go back and provide as a lookup uh, table. With that, I'd like to open it up for questions and thank you very much for your attention. I have the um, citation of the, the article down here and some contact information. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Fabian, we appreciate it. We do have a couple of questions for you from the audience. First comes from James Farrell, and he says, mm -hmm. you may have done this already, but just in case, mm -hmm or UMPI with attitude information available, mm -hmm. uh, GNSS IMU integration with ambiguous carrier phase differences over one second intervals offer very accurate attitude with just one antenna. Does mm -hmm. this sound like a useful single antenna approach? Uh -huh. Yeah, so from one single antenna and, and IMU, you can get very good attitude information. Yeah, so while I was working on this, uh, Professor Dave Powell was uh, one of my advisors, and he had done a lot of work on that as well. And he was always poking me on, uh, on, on not getting, if I can't get a better attitude out of this. Um, so if you can get attitude out of uh, just simple IMUs and, and GNSS, that's, that's always helpful. Um, in this UMPI setup, let me uh, go back maybe to one of the original slides here. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure it would make this setup uh, better. It would definitely... It would reduce sort of the the nuisance parameters on, on the under nominal conditions because you exactly know your attitude in this case. But the problem is that you still don't know under which which direction the spoofer broadcasts from. So you'd still have to look at the great circle arcs. So it would it would take me at least more time to think about it if uh, if uh, that attitude information would make would make the detection tests better, but. I'm not. I'm not sure it it would immediately um, because we don't. We still have this ambivalence of where the spoofer would uh, would broadcast from. I hope that answers the question. It's a it's a very good question and a yeah. It, you see me scratch my head. That that means that it's a very good question. <laughs> um, it, it, the answer is maybe not as straightforward as what I just said. Okay. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, the next question says uh, a significant factor with spoofing success or failure is the difference mm -hmm. in power between the unspoofed and spoofed signals. Yeah. The DP antenna architecture will cause signals at different azimuths to change mm -hmm. their uh, carrier to noise density with different phases. It could change how the tracking channels are behaving with the mixed signals. Could this be the main reason for the failed spoofing for some satellites in the constellation? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, this sort of change in power over time, could that um, make make the spoofer fail in his attack, essentially? And um, that is a good question, because this 
essentially what this antenna does, it, it steers a spatial null um, sort of in, in various directions uh, all the time it cycles through. Um, it, I did not have a side by side, at least I haven't seen data of sort of side by side antennas, one with that DPA setup and the other one without. Um, but it is, it is absolutely the case that uh, for small power advantage attacks, the spoofer can struggle to capture the, the receiver tracking loops, even with a normal antenna setup. So I've seen that just processing the, the text path data set, for example. Um, I'm, I don't know what the spoofer power advantage was in these scenarios here. All, all I know is what I see in the data here. Um, but it, it can make it it can make it more challenging. What one of the ideas or approaches that had been suggested by Emily when she developed this approach that I think is a, is a very smart idea is that once you've determined that there is a spoofer and you you can detect the direction the spoofer comes from, steer a spatial null in that detection in that direction, just like you can with antenna arrays, um, to to essentially mitigate the effect of those signals, and and so it, it's very much possible that at least that's part of the reason why the spoofer does not capture all the satellite signals here, as they were essentially mitigating that. It it depends a lot on how fast you rotate through um, these uh, rotate through the phase, so how often how frequently you steer these nulls, how long these nulls persist in each direction, um, how fast the tracking uh, loops of the receiver are. Uh, so there, there's a lot of, I guess, parameters that that go into that. Um, but it chances are high, it doesn't make it easier for the spoofer. Yeah, it, it definitely adds an additional uh, factor to it. That's a good question. Great, thank you. So if you have any other questions for Fabian, we don't have any right now, we can pause for 20 seconds or so, if you'd like to submit a question. Gives me a chance to drink a sip of water. That's good. That's right. <laughs> People asking for a slower speed. It, it was a fire hose of information. I, I admit that I may have gone a little fast. I did have a large cup of coffee this morning since it's 8 a.m. at the on the West Coast here. Um, yeah, I, I do encourage you to, lo to look at the paper and please reach out if, uh, if there are any questions. And we do have, uh, we will have a recording of the webinar uh, on our website at iowa.org. Um, and I would say, Fabian, that a lack of questions means you explained it all so thoroughly <laughs> room for any questions. So I, I like to believe that. Um, but yeah, we appreciate, oh, here's one, we'll, we'll take time for this question here. Um, Lock like a ratio is asymptotically chi squared distributed. So a Gaussian here in approximation. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. What is the, that means somebody really here knows uh, that in that knows has worked with uh, likelihood ratio tests um, quite a bit. Uh, that's a good question. What is the distribution, and why is this uh, why is this a Gaussian distribution of this uh, this log lambda? Um, I, I kind of glossed over that, and and maybe hope that people would just uh, accept that. Um, so it, it's actually not a it's not an approximation. Um, the distribution of log lambda here uh, really depends on if you have simple or composite hypotheses. If one of the two hypotheses is simple and the other one is a composite, this essentially turns into a chi-square test. And it's exactly as you said, it's, it follows a chi-square distribution. Um, and that's what you see, for example, in the sum of squares detector uh, paper. And uh, in the paper that I've pointed out at the end, uh, we're looking at combinations of, uh, of metrics. Um, this For some, a lot of the metrics where we have a composite hypothesis, um, this turns into a chi-square test. But if both hypotheses are simple, then this is, I believe, called, at least Van Treas calls it a special case of the general Gaussian problem. Um, essentially, if both likelihood ratios here, or both likelihoods have, a, have the same covariance matrix, then this all simplifies beautifully. And actually, this follows exactly a normal distribution once again, as much as, uh, as the individual likelihoods follow a normal distribution. Um, so. Yeah, that, that is a very mathy uh, question. I, I hope I, I got to explain that. Um, please, please reach out or in, in this paper here that I'm, uh, in this paper, we go through the, the math in detail really to, to, to make these considerations or simply a, a statistical processing textbook um, like Van Trace, which is an excellent book, uh, goes into the details of that. But that is a good question. Yeah, the, the distribution is very important. Okay, we have one more question. It says, uh, did you mm -hmm. consider signal outage if the threshold is below 17 dB? Uh, that that time we have to have eliminated a spoofed PRN. 
Um, yeah, so do we, I'm, I'm guessing this refers to sort of the, um, the spoofing data we can see, we can see here. Um, so I do not employ any uh, thresholds in terms of uh, signal strength. Um, th there is certainly a lot that, that could be done there or that you could consider doing um, to, to make additional decisions or, or infer, um, infer results based on the signal strength that you see. Um, it, it can get a little difficult. I mean, here we can see the, the signal strength of this yellow satellite drops to 21 dB or so, especially using this uh, DPA setup that causes these drops in signal strength every now and then. But my hunch is that this is a, an authentic satellite, so it, it gets almost close to 17, 17 dB here. Um, there, there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of elements to that question. It's uh, it's very we could talk all morning about that one almost. Um, if, for example, if a lot of uh, scenarios or spoofing attacks are preceded by a jamming attack, um, so first jamming and then the spoofer broadcasts their own signals uh, stronger. And during the jamming phase, actually, this DPA once again every now and then steers a spatial null towards the jammer, uh, so you can actually see the authentic satellite signal strengths come up shortly and then they drop down again because the, the null has moved on. But if you would take that into account and actively control the null direction, you could obtain authentic satellite uh, measurements with very low dB values because while well, that null isn't super strong and super precise, but strong enough that you can receive satellite signals and then they may be close to that threshold. But of course you need a receiver that's set up to be able to track those signals. So it, yeah. It, there's no simple answer to that question, but it's very, it's a very good question. There's a lot we could possibly infer from from the signal strengths, but I have not looked at that too much. This is really focused on direction of arrival. Great. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate those of you who've asked questions, and uh, we have an audience joining us today from around the world, many different time zones and areas of the world. <clears throat> so definitely a topic of interest. And uh, Fabian, we appreciate your time in uh, my pleasure this presentation available to us. Uh, our sincere thanks to you. Again, the recording will be available on our website. Uh, the full paper is, a down is available for download as well. And Fabian's also made his slides available. So those will all be available on our website uh, probably later today. Uh, the video may be uh, up tomorrow at the latest. So again, thanks for joining us and uh, have, a, have a wonderful day. Thank you.